and I will share my screen. So welcome uh, to the discussion about the mulberry and uh, the mulberry family for our plant ID course, uh, showing you a beautiful and magnificent tree uh, for some of the figs. So we get to talk about this family that is very important, but uh, it's also gonna have some very interesting characteristics uh, of, uh, uh, in the plant world. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the mulberry family, Moraceae after Morus, uh, the mulberry tree. Uh, that is going to be scattered throughout uh, the different tropical areas of the world. So found throughout the world. Now we're going to be talking about die cuts. And I think uh, before we've talked about mainly monocuts, the narrow leaf, like the orchids uh, and the aroids. Now it's going to be the die cuts, which is going to be now the broad leaves uh, or some of the other plants that are going to have more of a broad uh, leaf with uh, netted veins and uh, the ones that are, we're going to be considering trees. Uh, we're going to have like 39 genera. So this is a small family and the biggest member of the family is going to be the fig or the ficus that you have already seen a few of them. So you should already be familiar. Now you get to see the rest and about 1100 uh, plus uh, species. Obviously, we're not going to see uh, all of them. Uh, but we're just going to see the ones that have the most importance as far as humans are concerned. And so they are tropical in nature. Uh, they probably started from maybe something like this. This is uh, Dorstenia. And Dorstenia is going to be our first plant from this uh, family group. Uh, because this is going to be a tiny, small herbaceous compared to some of the other ones. So maybe it's a Dorstenia later or an ancestor that look kind of like Dorstenia later evolved into the other members. So for now, we're just going to take Dorstenia, <coughs> excuse me, that is going to be mainly a weed. So it's going to be a weedy individual. <coughs> That is going to come up in many nurseries, many greenhouses. It likes humidity uh, and it's going to spread out and kind of become uh, an invasive plant. Now, I like Dorstenia, don't get me wrong, uh, but that's probably how it started as an understory. And then as it evolved and became more complex and then uh, gather uh, a very intricate uh, method in pollinations for a few members, then it evolved into the plant that we have right now. Uh, but here's uh, the Dorstenia uh, flower grouping or flower cluster. So they kind of look like a star. Uh, and so we're going to take, once again, Dorstenia as our base uh, for members of this family. And uh, here's a close up of uh, a flower cluster or a receptacle that will have many, many tiny blossoms. Uh, and you can kind of see them right in the middle. Uh, so here's the leaves, and you can also see uh, this, this is a different Dorstenia, uh, Taba George, uh, that I took the photograph. And uh, here are the flower clusters for that individual. Uh, and there's uh, the stigmas that you see on uh, the blossoms for that. And so when we're going to be looking at Dorstenia and or members of this family, we're going to have a flower cluster as a group of flowers. So it's going to be known as a head in this case. And so you notice Dorstenia has more of a umbrella type uh, flower cluster that is open up to the air. And when we look inside, we're going to see several blossoms that are going to be embedded. So they're going to be sharing the same receptacle. And so within those blossoms, you can still see the stigma, the stigma that is fork or it is divides device, uh, into two and you see the style and that is going to lead to the ovary that is going to be down at the bottom. This is going to be very similar to the fig uh, or the flowers for a fig. They're going to be very small uh, but as one unit uh, this head like grouping uh, or this blooms in a receptacle they're going to be a little bit showy or you'll be able to notice them but individually the tiny blossoms are going to be almost inconspicuous. 
uh, there's going to be male and female blossoms. So the female blossoms will have the stigma with the ovary. Uh, the male blossoms will then have the stamens with the pollen and they might be, they're going to be separate. They may be together uh, in, within the same receptacle, uh, but they're going to be separate. So here we have just an assortment of different female flowers that you can see the stigma. And so this Dorstenia came to me as a weed. I purchased a peace lily, which is a different plant that we'll see later on. And then this started to grow. I was so happy that I got it, uh, that I yanked that peace lily out of there and I kept the Dorstenia as my new plant uh, in the container. Uh, and so here is uh, that blossom that I just shown you. Uh, and then uh, here is uh, when the blossoms have already been pollinated. Uh, you can also see some of the male blossoms that have the stamen. So that is a little tiny ball. So that is the anther and the filament. And you can see the female blossoms that are going to have that stigma with the ovary. So you see them there side by side. Uh, and uh, these are going to be the segments where the fruits will then be produced. Uh, so the fruits for Dorstenia is going to be an akin. Think about it as a sunflower seed. So it's just a single cell with an outer covering that is going to be a little bit crunchy if you were to bite them. Uh, and so the stigmas with the ovary will then become individual one seeded fruit, which is going to be known as the akin for our uh, Dorstenia. Uh, and so here is uh, Dorstenia as the base. Now this is a flat receptacle. Now take Dorstenia and fold it outwards so that all of the flowers are now going to be facing towards the outside. And so you have what is known as the mulberry. Uh, so now instead of having like a flat uh, flower cluster or receptacle, the mulberry is going to have a cylindrical uh, receptacle but you can see the individual blossoms here. Uh, the individual blossoms that have the stigma, there will be some that will have the stamens, just like Dorstenia, there's gonna be male and female blossom. So again, just Dorstenia flower folded uh, in a cylindrical shape uh, with all the flowers towards the outside. And so here are the male flowers. Uh, so you can see very different from the females that have the stigma, that's about it. And then the male flowers are just going to have five stamens with only pollen. And you can kind of see a nice side view of them on that side. Uh, so those will be also produced by the plant. And then eventually each of those uh, blossoms, female blossoms, will then become a fruit lip. Inside, it's still a one single seed individual, uh, but now the fruit is going to become fleshy and uh, it's going to become what is known as a multiple fruit. That each one came from their own tiny blossom, but as they mature, they're going to grow into one single unit and that is going to be the mulberry fruit. So the mulberry fruit is composed of very several different fruitlets combined to make one unit. And so you have the individual mulberry fruitlets here, and you can see the remnants of the stigma, which is gonna be uh, that darker area there. And you can see the boundary where they meet the, uh, I guess the neighboring blossom or the neighboring fruit. Mulberries are gonna be crunchy because inside this fruitlet, inside the fleshy component, is where you're gonna find that akin. Uh, that is going to be the fruit for this individual. Uh, here is as they beginning to mature uh, the fruitlets with the remnants of the stigma. And then uh, here in Long Beach, uh, we found a very nice, the Pakistan uh, mulberry that I mentioned in a different class that it was very, very good flavor. So this is what's growing uh, on the house, but it was leaning towards the street. And so these are very long and much better flavor and very, very sweet. Uh, so once again, that Dorstenia fruit that is our flower, the receptacle that is now cylindrical shape with all the flowers towards the outside and each individual fruit lit uh, becomes a single unit called a multiple fruit. And that becomes the mulberry. The mulberry that then 
became important because it started to grow bigger and became a tree and then it dominated uh, many parts of the forest. Uh, and there's, uh, in comparison to my hand, you can see the size of uh, the Pakistanian uh, mulberry. Uh, but mulberry have a much, much longer history, uh, perhaps, yes, as a fruit, but also as a source for silk. So the silk moth uh, are gonna have the caterpillars and their only food source is gonna be the mulberry leaves. And so it has been a custom in China to raise mulberries for uh, their fiber. So they're gonna have uh, drawers upon drawers of caterpillars feeding on the leaves. Uh, later on, when the moth uh, is gonna produce a cocoon out of the silk, uh, then those, that silk is uh, separated and the different strands are then blended together so that that creates what is known as the silk. And we know that silk um, is, could be very expensive and at certain point in time and in history, only the elite or the aristocrats uh, or kings or the monarchies were the ones that could use silk because it was very expensive to make. So here's uh, the cocoons. Uh, in most cases, they are going to be killed. I know that there is now a method that they use for saving uh, the moth so they don't kill it. Uh, but here's where you see the uh, silks being extracted. Uh, here's the individual silk strands being extracted by a machine and separate them. Uh, and then uh, here's where they have a silk ball and you have those uh, uh, silk moth uh, pupa that are either dead, but if, if you ever go to the store, uh, they are sold. So it is an edible product. You can buy them if you want to saute them with a couple of vegetables or not. You can also eat them by themselves. So it is a food source as well, uh, but most important and most economically would be the production of the silk. Uh, here with the silk, silk bowl after extracting the individual silks from the cocoon, and then eventually uh, starting to make the different fibers. Uh, and eventually you're gonna have the different cloth uh, that is gonna be uh, made out of silk and is the source of a moth that can only feed on mulberry trees. So very old history, but very, very important plant. There is another very important plant that is often not seen here. Uh, so this is across from Jordan High, I think, uh, or the park next to Jordan High in the North Long Beach area. Uh, it's a paper mulberry. So yes, a lot of the first per paper uh, is being, production of the first paper is being given to the Egyptians with the papyrus, which is a different plant. But before the Egyptians had paper, uh, the Chinese were already had a version of their paper and that came from uh, the fibers of this uh, mulberry tree or a different types of Brosinetia papyrifera. Papyrifera means uh, paper bearing. And so this is known as paper mulberry. So they'll take the leaves and the fibers and uh, they will, they use that to create some of the original Chinese papers and scrolls. Uh, where they started to put uh, and write down some of their knowledge and their language and everything else. So here's where it's going deciduous and uh, here's uh, the leaves uh, for that. Now if we take, once again, take Dorstenia and let's just change it a little bit where we're going to make it into a big ball. Once again, we're going to fold it, uh, but it's not going to be cylindrical like uh, the mulberry is going to be more of a big ball. Uh, then you have something like this, which is uh, the Osage orange. Now this is a tree that is native to Eastern United States and there's not too many of them here in Southern California. Uh, there's only one that I know in Long Beach and it's growing at Rancho Los Cerritos. Uh, and so here is a big brain looking thing uh, that is nothing more than Dorstenia kind of folded backwards and made into a ball. Uh, on the outside, you have the individual fruitlets that kind of become fused into that multiple fruit that gives it this specific form. Uh, so here's the, the tree, Rancho Los Cerritos. Uh, and uh, here is uh, some of the fruits 
uh, and the leaves. And there you can see the fallen fruit uh, and uh, the remnants of the stigma. So you can see where each of the individual uh, blossoms would have been. And here you can see where each of them would be. So same, same concept. Uh, but then you have something a little bit more important. The Osage orange has no real value other than some wood for construction. Uh, but the genus Artocarpus, which is the jackfruit, is of very, very good value. So here's a tree, I think it's on 24th and Santa Fe. This is one of the oldest uh, trees that I have encountered. Uh, and so here is the beginning of those jackfruits. So in a cylindrical, uh, cylindrical dorstenia uh, made into a cylindrical shape. Uh, with all the stamens and the stigma kind of peer, uh, peeping out of the uh, individual blossoms that you see there. Uh, those will eventually fuse together and create what is known as the jackfruit. Uh, and so here is the tree uh, with the, the fruit already maturing. And here's the tree where you have some, uh, probably the male flowers that obviously are not going to get a fruit. And then the female flowers that was next to it. Uh, that is going to uh, become the big fruit. Uh, and then you can still see uh, on the uh, skin, you can see the remnants of the stigma that is going to be divided into two. So you see it throughout uh, the fruit itself. Uh, and here's uh, the fruit as it's now maturing. So they will grow outdoors here in Long Beach. They will set fruit and they will mature the fruit. However, the fruit can be eaten in any stage when it's very young and green. It can be used as a vegetable. As it gets older, it can still be used as a vegetable. Uh, you can eat the seeds, you can eat uh, the interior, and then when it, must, uh, when it ripens, then you can eat it as a sweet fruit later on. And there I am for scale holding uh, the fruit. And this tree is growing here on Signal Hill, uh, just right on, very close to the Home Depot on top of Signal Hill uh, by the spring one. Uh, and then uh, here's uh, some of the ones from the store. So they are now grown uh, in Mexico, in Chiapas, Mexico. And so if you see them in the stores here in the United States or Southern California, it's most likely the origin is Mexico. Uh, originally, they are from Southeast Asia and all the way into the Pacific Islands and throughout that area. Uh, and uh, it could be even bigger ones. So this is going to be one of the biggest, not individual fruit, obviously, uh, a multiple fruit or a grouping of several blossoms put together. Uh, so it could be quite large. Uh, here's uh, in the wild, or not in the wild, but growing uh, in Brazil. So you have uh, the jackfruits. And so here's how, if you cut them in half, that's what you're going to get. So you have the individual fruitlets here. Now you can kind of see the dividing line and then each one has a very large seed inside and some fiber that is still edible, but most people will only eat more of this orangey color because it's gonna have better flavor and it's gonna be sweeter. Uh, here's uh, just a bee harvesting a little bit of the sugar from uh, the jackfruit that was on the ground. And so the other thing that we know is common with members of this family is going to be that white latex. So jackfruit has it, the figs have it. Uh, so the latex that is going to be that white uh, covering or uh, that is going to come out when you injure the plant. In this case, you can see uh, the bees uh, collecting the latex from the fruit. And you see it here on their legs uh, and see it here as well. So the bees are going to use uh, the latex to waterproof their nest. Coming from the tropics here in Brazil, there is going to be a lot of rain and most of this uh, wasp will have a nest that is maybe made out of paper. So in order for make it to waterproof it, they will coat uh, their nest with the latex that will eventually become rubber that will eventually uh, repel the water and ensure that the bees do not lose uh, their nest or their home because of the rain. So here's a, a different benefit for wildlife for this latex. So, and 
Uh, here's a, a different species. So this is a jackfruit, but a little bit smaller. So there are many, many different species of jackfruits, each one bearing a different size fruit and each one having a slightly different flavor. Uh, here's a truck with a lot of jackfruits, so a bed full of jackfruits ready for uh, for the market. Uh, and uh, here's a picture of that. And uh, a very close uh, relative of jackfruit is going to be the breadfruit. Uh, breadfruit, which is going to be here growing in Cuba. It's a little bit more tropical, so I have yet to see one here in Southern California. So if you know one, let me know, because I'm looking for one. Uh, so I had to go into the tropics to see it, a uh, very, very large leaves. And uh, here's uh, the beginning of the flower, so that receptacle, that later becomes uh, the fruit itself. Uh, and so you can see here, when they cut it, you can still, it was still able to bleed some of the sap. So eaten as a vegetable, I guess you can fry it, you can boil it. I have yet to try it because I guess when I was there, there was none available. Uh, and uh, here's a few more. Uh, and uh, until very recently, within the last few months, I have started for the first time being offered for sale here in Southern California. So there is only one market in Westminster that I've seen it. Otherwise, uh, this fruit has eluded me for many, many years. Uh, and so now, let's go back to the senior, uh, and now let's change the uh, receptacle. Now we are going to close the receptacle and make it hollow inside. So now we are going to put uh, the different blossoms inside. Uh, and when that happens, you get what is known as a fig. Uh, the fig, which is the fruit for the ficus. And uh, for a fig, the name is going to be, for the fruit, is going to be the fig. But the real name is going to be siconium because this structure is going to be unique to the ficus and the figs. So once again, Dorstenia, if we were to close it, uh, we're going to have a fig that now has only one entry point. So on one side is going to be the stem that is holding uh, the receptacle to the fruit, uh, sorry, to the tree, and on the other side is going to be a tiny hole. So if we look at it from the face view, uh, the hole for the fig is going to be known uh, by this rifle name, which is Osteo, uh, Osteoli. Uh, so that is going to be the site for a female wasp to go into uh, this uh, fig. Uh, and so when the fruit is maturing and when the blossoms inside is, are now receptive or and are now producing pollen, then it's going to keep on getting bigger. And uh, right now it is not ready, so the ostole is closed. But when it's ready, it's going to open and wait for that wasp to come in. Uh, so when we cut the fig in half, uh, this is what we're going to find. We're going to find both male and female flowers. So when Jake was asking me, do they flower? The answer is yes. The flowers are always inside the fig or the receptacle itself, this uh, structure. They're going to be inconspicuous because they don't need to attract anybody. Uh, there's going to be male and female flowers. The male flowers are going to be usually towards the entrance of the fig. And the female flowers, you see them here with the stigma and the ovary or the over, o, ovary right here. Single seed, uh, that's uh, what we're going to be finding. So this would constitute uh, the flowers of all the different figs that are out there. So never see the sunlight. You will never see it unless you cut the fig in half or you open it and you will be able to see them. So here are the male flowers towards the entrance, the male flowers that are just going to produce pollen. And here are the female flowers. And you can once again see the stigma kind of divided into two. Uh, the female flowers obviously have a little bit more of a wider base because that's going to be where the ovary and eventually the fruit of the fig will be. So when you look at a fig and you eat it, you're not really eating the fruit. The fruit are the individual 
nutlets that are going to be right here. They're going to be in a keen like Dorstenia. Uh, the fruit, uh, the fleshy portion of the fruit is nothing more than the receptacle uh, that has been enclosed or has closed itself up. And so if we take an individual flower from a fig, it's going to be like this. Uh, here is uh, the flower. Here is uh, the peduncle. So there's just an ovary with a uh, stigma for this case. And then the fruit that I took away uh, is going to be this uh, akin. And so here's a, a immature flower or not yet being pollinated. And there's the, just the ovary with the stigma and the style and everything else. So that is the flower for figs. Uh, and so when you look at the different figs, once they have dev uh, devised this method of enclosing uh, their flowers or their blossoms, and once they made a relationship with a specific wasp, then they begin to diversify. Uh, and so depending on the fig, they're gonna change their, depending on the ficus or the fig plant, they're gonna change their fig uh, according to their different species. So we have, some of them that are going to be reddish, but you see exactly the same characteristics, the tiny osteoli or the hole where the wasp goes in. Some of them with hairs, uh, some of them just smooth, and uh, here's another one. Uh, so different figs are going to have different colors, different shapes, different sizes, uh, and, uh, and that's going to be according to the fig species that they belong to. Figs are very important, so not only have we had the first paper from a mulberry plant. We got in silk from a mulberry plant. Uh, figs have also been a very, very early cultivated plant. So the humans rely on figs as they were moving around exploring. The answer is yes. Uh, there are also very important figs uh, in human or in different cultures. So now let's look at the pollination of uh, uh, the figs. So we are going to start the pollination with a female wasp. A female wasp that is going to be carrying with her the pollens from the pollen from a different fig. So they are, I mentioned before that they are going to have an exclusive pollinator. So only one specific wasp will pollinate a specific fig. And that's it. So every single fig species that is out there is going to have just one wasp that would be primarily be the pollinator, maybe another one here and there, but usually it's going to be very specific wasp. So the wasp is going to fly. Uh, uh, it's going to have with her uh, pollen, and then it's going to look for a fig that is at the right time, the right time when the flowers are going to be receptive. So the first thing that it's going to do, it's going to uh, force its way through the tiny hole or the tiny osteoli. In, that, in the process of going into the fig, uh, her wings are going to be destroyed. Uh, she will not come out of the fig. She's going to die in there. That is the end of her life. But before she dies, she is going to deposit an egg. She's going to lay an egg into the different ovules of the different or several different uh, flower blossoms that are going to be within the fig. As she's laying the egg or afterwards, she is going to deliberately put the pollen onto the stigma of those flowers that she uh, parasitized with her eggs. Now in the process, she's gonna pollinate much more, uh, but it is the developing ovaries that the baby wasp will feed on. Uh, and so, it's relying and she knows this and that's why she deliberately pollinates the flowers that uh, will house or will feed its babies. Now is the fig losing? The answer is yes. The fig is sacrificing a few of its flowers, a few of its seeds, a few of its fruits, uh, but in the process it ensures that it will definitely get pollinated because there's going to be wasps that are going to be relying on the fig just as the fig is relying on the wasp. So it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. They each get a benefit and they each sacrifice a little bit. So once the female has laid her eggs, once the female has pollinated the flower, she's then gonna die. Her job is done. 
Uh, and so she's going to remain in the fish. She's never going to come out. She will never see the sunlight again. Uh, and so here is a, a fig, just a common fig that we have in the garden. And here is when I was able to cut any half. And there's a tiny, very, very tiny wasp. So I was able to photograph it and I think I have video. Uh, and so when you look at some of these figs, you can see where there's going to be many, many wasps. So there is a reason why for a very long time figs were not accepted as a vegan food because they will have insects in it, all of them. And there is, uh, there was a time when they first started to import the fig plants into California to develop the fig industry. They, they failed miserably because they brought the figs, but they never brought the wasp with it. It was later on when a scientist, somebody figured out, okay, I need to go back to the Middle East. I need to find out why they have figs and we don't. And the clue or the answer was they have the wasp and we don't. And once they brought the wasp into California, now we have a fig industry. Uh, so now I believe that they have selected some of the figs to bear the fruit or ripen the fruit and the fig without having to be pollinated but there's nothing to exclude any of the wasps from going in there. Uh, so even if you, they might say it is vegan now, mm, I, I wouldn't trust that. But anyway, that's a different story. So yes, every single fig, if it has gone through the right process, if it has matured in the fruit, uh, it's going to be edible and it's going to be, uh, it's going to have wasps inside. And if we have a ficus or a fig that will not ripen, it's because we probably don't have the appropriate wasp here. And that's why we may just, the fruit may drop and nothing happens. And so now that the wasp is dead, now it is the job of the eggs to eventually mature and hatch. So when the eggs mature, uh, then the first ones that are going to come out are going to be uh, the male wasp. The male wasp are going to be blind uh, and uh, they are not going to do anything but mate with their females that are there. So yes, they will be mating with their sisters. Uh, so they will come out first and they'll search around the fig and they will mate with this uh, female. And then they have a very important role. Once they have made it with the females that are still uh, waiting to come out, they are then going to chew a hole through the fig to allow the female to go out. Once they have chewed that hole, they will then die. Their job is done. So the male of the species only has one job to mate and let the female out. And they will never see the sunlight. They will never see anything. Uh, or they will never come out and they will never eat. Uh, so they'll die in the fit. The female, once it has emerged, now she has been fertilized by the male, she will then go to the male flowers and pick up the pollen. Uh, pick up the pollen from this specific fig. Then she's going to use that tunnel to escape the fig and go look for a different fig that she will then enter and begin the cycle all over again. So if you think about a fig, a fig is the entire world uh, for this specific grouping of very tiny wasps. Many of them will never see the sunlight and the female just goes out to the next fig where she will po fertilize, pollinate, and then she'll die. So she may see the sunlight once, she may get one single meal, and then she goes inside the fig and then she dies. And that's it. And the cycle continue on and on and on. Uh, and that is the cycle for every single fig that is out there. The same cycle with a specific wasp. Uh, so males kind of useless, just mate and let the female out and die. Uh, so it's very intricate. It's a one-to-one -one relationship as we also saw with uh, some of the orchids. Uh, but in this case, both of them re require each other. Uh, here are some of the wasps once again. And so here is the fruit. So here's the fruit for those figs. And you can see the exit holes uh, where the wasp came out of. And so it's chewed its way. And so now it's going to 
uh, fly away uh, and go out. I don't see any wings, so this might be one of the male. And you see a few other fruits, which is going to be that akin that are probably also parasitized, or they have the wasps uh, within within them. Uh, and uh, here's a, a bunch more uh, where you can see. Uh, combination of different wasps that have died and some of them are going to come out and a bunch of other things. So it's it's extremely complicated cycle here uh, with all happening in that tiny structure known as the fig. Uh, the figs are going to be very important in nature. Uh, all the figs are edible. However, if they don't get pollinated, they might not be as good. Uh, so humans, I mentioned, have relied on figs for many, many years. Uh, animals rely on figs for many, 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 many millions of years. And uh, in the tropics, when there is a fig tree that is ready, it's going to uh, ripen its figs at the same time. And every animal within miles is going to go there and devour the figs. So it's very important also in the reforestation or when there is a need for human does some damage to the forest, it is the figs that are going to start to reforest and reinitiate some of the forest uh, for the, the animals and the wildlife. So they are going to be spread by bats, birds, and every other animal that eats figs uh, is going to be very uh, helpful in dispersing the seeds and getting them to germinate. Uh, we mentioned the latex. So here is the figs with uh, the white latex or the rubber. Uh, and uh, here is uh, that uh, the wound. Uh, with uh, the rubber, you can see kind of here where it's just creating a strand. Uh, and uh, here's where I uh, I was in the tropics, I think it's Ecuador, and they cut a fig tree down. And you can see uh, the sap, the latex coming out of the vascular system, which is the xylem and the phloem. So you can see where it was still spewing or bleeding out. A uh, very nice circular pattern there. Uh, so that's Oregon. Uh, I mentioned before, when working with figs, be very careful, even though you might not be allergic to it. Uh, if it's very hot, uh, it could have some severe burns. And so here's a picture of uh, the hands of one of my students, uh, so my name of Ty, who sent it to me to warn you that uh, he got exposed to the latex pruning a fig tree and it was 90 degrees and all of a sudden he started uh, getting all of these blisters. Uh, and even though he's not allergic to it, uh, it happens. So there is a, uh, a third, second degree, a third or second degree possibility of uh, burn uh, if you're working with them in very hot temperature. So be very careful. Uh, this is not something that you want to be working with if it's very, very hot, or obviously if you are allergic or have any allergies to the rubber or the latex, you probably shouldn't be touching them. Uh, we have several trees here, so Ficus elastica. Unfortunately, this is no longer there. Uh, this was across uh, the right, it would be about here. Uh, but here's the elastica as a tree. I mentioned don't do this. Uh, the tree is now gone, so, but it was, it's a beautiful tree. And if you were to say what would be a very nice forest, it would definitely be ficus uh, because they will make a beautiful tree that you can definitely put a tree house on top and enjoy uh, a lot of shade and a bunch of other things. Uh, so there's uh, the leaves. Uh, and uh, here's the figs. It will only happen when the tree is older, uh, but there are the very tiny figs for ficus elastica. Uh, and uh, Ficus elastica was cultivated for the latex at one point or another. Uh, so there was a time when they would milk uh, the latex. Uh, and uh, you can see where they catch it. And then they'll boil it and go through the process of then turning it into rubber. Uh, it wasn't a very high quality latex. So as people started finding other plants that could also be providing this, it got replaced by Castilla elastica, which is in a different family that we'll talk and we'll see it later on. Ficus are also known for their buttress roots. So those very, very big roots that are going to come out of the ground and or support the tree. Keeping in mind that they are very large trees, they're going to need a very big, broad, solid base. And so this buttressing allows them to hold onto the ground. Not only that, they may also be prone 
two areas where there might be some slides, landslides or flooding, and so they have to hold themselves and that's what's gonna eventually, what eventually led them to develop this buttressing. Or they may have to go to grow through rocks and a bunch of other very difficult areas. And so having very strong root system is gonna give them the edge uh, in surviving and feeding other plants. And so here I am uh, in the tropics sitting on one of those roots and you can see the very big fan uh, of uh, that buttress root for this fig. Uh, here are some of the figs that will also generate a lot of aerial roots. So figs are known, if there's a lot of humidities, they will just have roots that are going to burst out of the stem. As the roots continue on growing, they're gonna touch the ground and they will become a, another stem. This is gonna help support some of the branches and so trees can keep getting wider and wider and wider, keep sending roots down, eventually turning to stems. And this tree can go for several miles. I think the biggest tree of this kind is in Hawaii. Uh, and I think it's like a mile wide. It's just this one tree that has managed to spread that far. Uh, and so here's uh, the original tree and here's a buttress root. Not a buttress root, an area root now becomes stem. Here's another one and here's another one and all of those around are all uh, roots that became stems later on. So something common with some of these figs. Uh, this one is uh, at the uh, LA Arboretum. It's kind of hidden so you need to know where it is. But you can see where over time the roots have grown out. Uh, they are now touching the ground for this one and some of these others they are now covering the stem as well. So they'll help out the tree eventually or in the long run. The same buttressing uh, is going to be the problem when we are going to be dealing with the street trees. Uh, one of the biggest trees out there, uh, the Indian laurel fig, Ficus uh, nida, it's, it's horrendous. It's a big tree. It should never be planted in the, as a street tree. Uh, and so broken cement, broken pipes, broken, uh, not broken, but plugged out or clogged uh, drain uh, in sewers is gonna be very common because those root systems are very strong and they'll find the water and or break through things to get the water uh, that they need. Uh, so here's just a fact examples and it's part of the nature. So here is uh, in Baja, uh, this is uh, Ficus petularis. It's just growing out of the rocks and hugging the rocks and growing in between and it's just how they survive. And so if they're able to burst and move rocks to get the roots through, uh, breaking a sidewalk, breaking the street, breaking some pipes is nothing to the tree because uh, they have dealt with bigger stuff. Uh, here's uh, a, in Cuba, here's uh, a tree uh, and you see the branch, almost every inch of the lower branch has become a, gotten a brand new root uh, that keeps on growing down. And uh, here's a, view from a little bit farther, more humidity, so it's able to do this. Uh, and there's some of the roots, uh, some of them have already cling onto the uh, wall and the side of the hill and a few that are going a little bit further down. So we do have our ficus carica, the edible fig, uh, the one that is from the Mediterranean, Middle East area, uh, the one that it was cultivated by people very early on uh, and uh, it was a very important source of food and is still eaten by people today. Uh, we have uh, ficus uh, sycamorum. And so this would be the ficus or the fig that is important for or has been mentioned in the Christian uh, Bible. Uh, sycamorum meaning sycamore, common name is sycamore fig. And so whenever you see the word sycamore in the Bible, whenever you read it, it is not talking about the California sycamore or the London Plain. It is talking about this fig, which is not native to Northern Africa and uh, into a uh, little bit into the Mediterranean. Uh, so it's edible in, uh, in the native habitat. I don't think we have... Uh, the pollinator here because I have yet to find a ripe fruit. Uh, so here's the, the fruit and uh, the fruit in this case is going to be known as cauliflory, 
which means that they're going to burst out of the big stem. They're not going to be at the tips like the regular fig. Uh, many figs will have special branching uh, with flowers right out of the thick stem or the trunk, and that's where the figs are going to be produced. So here, the sycamore fig, you have kind of clusters that look like grapes of the different figs right on the trunk. Perhaps it's an invitation for an animal, perhaps when it's very hot and the figs are ripened, the tree or the the tree was providing a nice cool shade area for the animals to be feeding on the figs and that ensures that they're uh, going to be eating the figs and dispersing the seeds somewhere else. So perhaps that's why something like this could have evolved on the tree. And then we have uh, Ficus religiosa, which is the Buddha tree. And so in the Buddha's religion or the Buddha's faith, this is the important tree because Buddha sat under this tree when he got enlightened. Now the original tree is still alive. Uh, later on, uh, uh, the, uh, the wife of a monarch who became Buddhist was very angry that their husband became a Buddhist and she ordered the tree to be chopped and they did. Uh, but out of the stem, there was a very tiny shoot that came out. That shoot and eventually the tree got propagated, sent out different areas. And so the original tree that Buddha sat under genetically still out there. Uh, but now you find this Buddha tree in different areas uh, here in Long Beach. So there's uh, the leaves and there's a very distinct leaf with a very long drip tip. And uh, we do have figs. Uh, they're not that good, but they seem to be maturing. I don't have never seen a wasp in here, so maybe they just mature, but then drop and not really produce viable seeds. Uh, here's a, a, a bigger one. Uh, this one is by MacArthur Park in LA. Uh, and uh, there's been uh, other figs that are out there that I'm still trying to figure out what they are. Uh, this one is in MacArthur Park in LA. Uh, West LA area and uh, was there with uh, Dan Hodel, which is a friend of mine who's also a tree and a plant person. And so we came across it, photographed it, recorded, propagated, uh, and there's a fix for this individual. Uh, and there's a close up uh, when I cut it in half to show you uh, the immature uh, fruitlets. Uh, and then the second one that was planted next to it is uh, this one. I think I, I, I have this one in the garden. Uh, and then uh, we have the creeping fig. So we have trees. We have uh, uh, ficus pumila here taking over this uh, light post uh, that was left for it. Uh, here's uh, the figs. I mentioned the figs are going to be big. They don't really mature. They just turn color and they drop. There's the osteoli, uh, the, the hole. And that's when they're kind of mature. I'm going to say that word. Uh, but there's nothing for you to eat. I don't think we have the right pollinator here or that we don't have the wasp. And then uh, Ficus auriculata. Uh, this is very large. Uh, very few individuals are around here, but it's always a nice tree to see. Uh, it's also going to have this very, very large fig. Uh, I mentioned the word cauliflory before. Uh, there is a word. Uh, so you see the branching stems that are keep producing figs. Uh, on a regular basis. So this almost looks like donuts. I don't think we have the pollinator, so they don't really turn color. They don't really become soft. Uh, whether they're good or not, I don't know until we get that pollinator here uh, and it can do the job for us. Uh, and there's uh, the fruits uh, or the figs, the receptacle with the osteoli. Uh, and then ficus capensis uh, from Cape South Africa. Uh, only one that I know uh, in a park in LA uh, and uh, there's the leaves and also cauliflower uh, with uh, the figs in the cluster and also unable to taste it because uh, no wasp to pollinate it and there's a figs that just kind of turn color and then drop in nothing for you to eat and even there will be the flowers that felt even mature or do anything. So there's the inside of the fig with the osteoli and the different flowers. And then uh, ficus darimopsis. So this is a very large leaf. I think this is more of a primitive, uh, probably how some of those figs may have eventually developed. So here's, you can see 
uh, that the fig or the zirconium is covered with some kind of scale like so some kind of leaf that will protect it very very large leaf a uh, very very large fruit uh, here is one of the nicest one that I've seen this is in uh, Pedro uh, right along Pacific Avenue going towards the beach uh, and uh, here is one that is growing in uh, rainforest flora so if you've never been there it's a great site for Tillandsia bromeliads uh, it's an 190th and Hawthorn, so rainforest flora. Uh, so they have a nice display area. And there's my hand uh, for scale for this very large leaf. And uh, here's uh, the figs or the fruit. And uh, when they are mature, they may look like flowers. So you may have seen them as a dry flower, like a dry flower arrangements. Uh, and uh, then we have the ficus petiolaris. Uh, this is one of the nicest trees. I've seen it before many times as a tiny bonsai or as a small tree, tree. But here is a nice tree, the only one that I've seen, I think there may be two now, uh, in language, but by far this is probably one of the best in the United States. It's an eighth and uh, obispo, eighth and obispo. Uh, and so here's uh, the, the leaves. And uh, it comes from Baja into mainland Mexico. So this is uh, in Jalisco, uh, where I saw it just growing down from a cliff. And you can see the roots just cascading over, gripping the plant. And it's, it's doing very well. Uh, and uh, here's the fruit or the fig for this individual. Uh, and then ficus drupacy, which is uh, uh, mysore fig. I think that's a common name. Uh, this one is grown in uh, Parker States uh, by Cal State or Long Beach State. Uh, and uh, here's the leaf and the fruit uh, looks almost like a, like a plum. However, it is fleshy, but it's not good. Uh, I don't think we have the pollinator to make it taste flavorful or make it sweet. So I don't know, uh, but they are quite large and there's uh, the interior of this uh, fig. Uh, and then we have uh, ficus rubiginosa, the rusty leaf fig. I hate to say this tree is no longer there. Uh, it was in Carroll Parks right next to the church. Uh, and I've been through there a couple of times and I was sad to see it gone. Uh, so they changed the landscape and the tree is now gone. Uh, so there's uh, the figs. And you can see the holes where the wasp came out of. So that's the uh, hole that the male wasp chew its way through for the female wasp to come out. Uh, and uh, also ficus, uh, Morton Bay fig, uh, ficus microphylla. This is from Australia and this are at Rancho Los Cerritos and there's some at Rancho Los Alaminos. Yes, they are very large. No, I would not like for you to have them in your house unless you have a very large area because but there are magnificent trees, uh, very huge uh, buttress uh, roots uh, and uh, here's some of the figs and uh, again, they don't get pollinated so they're not really edible and or uh, the Indian laurel fig this would be the very common street tree that you see out there so if you see a massive green tree uh, for some reason it is being pollinated because we started finding baby seed trees everywhere so here is a baby tree that somehow either a bird some of the parrots may have dropped the seed and uh, it landed on the palm and you can see the roots growing towards the ground. Uh, and so it germinated. So something is pollinating it, probably the wasp now. Uh, and don't be surprised if you see baby plants out there. Here is one that probably was never planted on the steps to the house. The bird dropped the seeds and the tree is doing what it does best, find a nice groove, a crack and germinate and begin to grow. Obviously, they have no idea what this tree is going to do later on. So I'm surprised that it was even allowed to grow this size on the steps leading to the house. Came up by itself. And uh, if you look up, it is not uncommon to see them growing out of palms or other trees. So here, probably a bird dropped the seeds and uh, it's germinated and it's growing over time. This could be very heavy over time. This palm could fail because there's going to be a gigantic tree uh, uh, on the canopy. 
will the roots grow towards the bottom and eventually hit the ground? The answer is yes. In the meantime, it's taking the resources it needs just from the dead leaves and the water that it may be catching by the dew or the mist or even the rain. Uh, but don't be surprised, start looking up, look up and you'll see baby uh, Indian laurel figs out there. Uh, here's uh, Ficus maclelandi, uh, the one that we saw today. Uh, this is uh, planted on uh, church property on uh, the west side of town. Uh, so here's probably one of the better trees that I've seen in Long Beach. Uh, here they are by the convention center, maybe. Uh, uh, but here's uh, in a container, uh, kind of braided, uh, maybe not the convention center, maybe somewhere else. Uh, and there's uh, the individuals. And uh, this, if you see closely, there's uh, the leaf, but there's also the fig. So they, I mentioned there have to be certain size. So that's the fig uh, for this individual. Uh, Ficus benjamina, uh, the common Chinese weeping banjan. Here is uh, the one in the garden that was a little bit smaller. I think this is after it got pruned. Uh, and uh, you can see the leaves there and also the fig that is dropping hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them now. Uh, and there's uh, the osteoli or the opening for the fig uh, and the, the variegated form that we have. And figs are highly abused. I mentioned they are very popular throughout Central and South America, uh, but they are extremely abused. So here's where they not meant to be a street tree. And so they also keep hacking them and pruning them and creating weird shapes. Every kind of shape that is out there, you can make it, make a fig out of it. Uh, so mushrooms and bigger ones, and they keep getting bigger or the multi poodle, uh, the square, uh, rectangle. Uh, there's the pompons or the different pompons, the Christmas tree. And the multi-tier, multi multi-poodle. Obviously this should not be here, but hey, people want it. And here's a tree house. Uh, so not bad work, <laughs> but here's a, a ficus that was made into a tree house with this window. And then uh, Ficus lyrata, we'll get to see this one later, the fiddle leaf figs, very large leaf. I think this is by Bixby and uh, Cherry, somewhere in that area. And there's a few other trees around here in Long Beach. Uh, here's uh, one in the house. Uh, very, very large leaves. And here's the figs for this individual. So we'll get to see this one later. Uh, and uh, here's a fig uh, that I happen to collect. Here's where they're going to be growing out of the nursery. So this was one of the more popular wholesalers for tropical plants. Uh, so because the tree plants were tall, uh, they make a hole and they bury a pot. So when they put these ones in here, they're not going to flop to the side. They don't have to worry about knocking them down or picking them up or anything. Uh, and so it's a great way of growing them. And you can see a mass bed of uh, this fiddle leaf fig. And uh, here's the leaf of uh, one that we have here. And then there's gonna be a few shrubby ones. So those are big trees. Uh, this is Ficus deltoide, which is the mistletoe fig. Uh, mistletoe fig because the figs are going to turn color, reddish color in the December uh, during our Christmas season. Uh, and that's how they got the name. It does have a triangle leaf, uh, but the back of the leaf will have spots and that's how you can separate it from the triangularis, but this is gonna be way smaller. Uh, and here's the little fig for this individual uh, with the osteoli. Uh, and then ficus buxifolia or the box leaf uh, fig, looks like boxwood is gonna be very small. Most of these smaller individuals are going to be not grown for landscape, not grown for container. Uh, but grown to be trained as a bonsai. Uh, and so, because you can make them look like a tree in a very young age, and they will have that very nice thick stem. And there's the fig for uh, box leaf uh, fig, uh, ficus, ficus buxifolia. And then uh, ficus salicifolia, which is the willow leaf fig. I might still have it, uh, but this is another popular bonsai. 
tree and uh, here's uh, the fig for this. Uh, and or a few other figs, I, mean, I keep finding them. Uh, as long as I find a ciconium or a fig, I know it's a ficus. What species? I may not have an idea, uh, but people keep bringing them and planting them. Here's a street tree. I was again down for Dell and I have photographs and figs and I just got to sit down and figure out where and what the species is. Uh, or uh, this other individual that I came across somewhere in the tropics uh, as I was exploring. Uh, or this one is from Chiapas, Mexico. It looks like little cups, little barrels. So the osteol is very open in this case uh, for this fig. Uh, and there's the osteoli. Uh, or in uh, Cuba, here's uh, just a random fig growing there. Uh, and so here's the leaf. And uh, again, if you find the fig, because the fig is going to be the only fruit, I guess, uh, of uh, this individual, then you know it's a ficus. So I can say, yeah, it's a ficus for sure. Uh, and then there's going to be the clown, the fig. Very few around here, uh, but it is going to be a variegated individual uh, that is going to be grown for the foliage. So the foliage is going to be variegated with uh, white and pinkish and so will the fig itself. It's gonna also be variegated. So clown fig, I know very few here in Long Beach. It's a little bit cold tender, uh, protected during the younger stage, and then you can have it for as a big shrubby individual. I have yet to see any big trees around here, uh, but here it is growing uh, in Cartoon's nursery where he propagated them and sold them uh, clown fig. Uh, and there's some more shots of it and uh, more of the figs uh, and close up on that uh, and here's uh the ficus religiosa this one is uh from uh, uh the fullerton arboretum and uh the sign says that uh the dalai lama uh came to bless uh that specific tree uh, and it now has a nice sign and once again here's a banana fig and here is that other shot of uh, that uh, in the laurel fig that should not be there, uh, but people don't know. And so with that and knowing how beautiful, but how deadly and bad the trees could be, are there any questions that anybody might have? Any questions? All right, well, then I start the recording.